Monster is an awesome series, but the ending can leave people with a big old case of the what happened? Today I want to look at this ending and try to explain what's going on. This will include a short dive into Johan's character as well because, well, it's important. I do have to admit that for a long time I was in the camp that I thought this ending was underwhelming. You what? But have since changed my mind. So we'll save a section at the end to go through those thoughts as well. Note that there are extra details in another monster, but for this video we're going to be keeping those out. Let's be honest, chances are if you've gone through Monster already, you haven't read another monster anyway. So let's judge Monster purely on its own story. Here's today's menu. Firstly, a recap of what happens, from Ruinheim onwards to the empty bed. Then we'll discuss that ambiguous ending, the what could happens, and why it works. During this, we're going to cut to talk about Johan and the idea of the perfect suicide for a while, so let's add that in here. Finally, to address some of my old thoughts around, was it underwhelming? Let's crack in. I think the best way to tell the story is by starting at the end, briefly, then going back to the beginning. The whole ending sequence revolves around Johan going to the town of Ruinheim, where Franz Bonaparte is currently living, Bonaparte being the experimenter behind Johan's own birth and the murders of the Red Rose Mansion. Johan begins sowing distrust and fear, distributing guns and turning all of the inhabitants against each other, essentially recreating the fall of Kinderheim on a larger scale. When the chaos is at its peak, Johan appears before Tenma and Bonaparte. Bonaparte is quickly killed by Johan's right-hand man, Roberto, before dying himself. Then Johan presses Tenma to kill him by threatening the young Wim. Before Tenma can take the shot, Wim's father appears and shoots Johan. After the village quietens down, Tenma saves Johan from a bullet to the head once again. Next we see Johan is the following year, when he is seemingly unconscious in bed. Tenma visits, telling Johan about how he met his mother and learned his true name. Johan bolts upright and tells Tenma the final piece of the puzzle, how his mother gave one of her children away to the Red Rose Mansion. And Johan wonders which child was unwanted, him or his sister. Then Johan is back to sleep and Tenma leaves. The final shot being of an empty hospital bed. If I had to pick one word to describe the strengths of Monster, I'd have to go with cohesive. It's no secret I'm a big fan of Naoki Urasawa, and this series is the most well-contained and consistent series I've read of his. Throughout Monster, all the different story threads weave together and pay off in different areas with reveals sprinkled in that make sense to the story overall. When details are left out or left vague, I can only come to the conclusion that it's intentional. Keep that in mind as we look at this ending. The empty hospital bed raises a lot of questions to the ending. The biggest of all, where did Johan go? Based on this story alone, basically every option is on the table. He could be dead, escaped to raise hell, in prison, fleeing to live a better life, still in a coma, and so on. Note that the final discussion between Tenma and Johan may have all just been in Tenma's head. Tenma wakes up, for want of a better term, after the conversation, with Johan unconscious once again. The information they discuss could have easily come from the mother in Tenma's earlier discussion with her, so there is a case that he's just daydreaming this, an almost nightmare about the conversation he wanted to have with the unconscious Johan. Regardless, the question remains, where is Johan now? This is something that the author likes to do. If you've gone through Billy Bat, you'll know that Urasawa likes his open-ended endings, letting your interpretation of events conclude the series. A lot of this depends on how you view Johan and how you view his actions. We're going to hit pause here in a moment to look at Johan, but before that, let's raise the second hidden question in this ending. What should happen to Johan? Where Johan is depends on your interpretation of his character and elements in the ending, but what should happen to him is based on your own scale of morality, so to speak. You may say that after all he's been through, he's been redeemed and should have escaped to go and live a better life. Or you might lay out the list of the boy's crimes and say STOP RIGHT THERE CRIMINAL SCUM Or you might say it's better he's left in a coma, a cruel irony of losing the last shred of humanity, his ability to make choices. Or whatever, it's a personal reflection on what we as the reader or viewer think is correct, and this is where the ending can become frustrating. Where you think Johan does end and where you want him to, do not agree. 
Okay, pause. Let's go and look at Johan. Good luck. It's murder time. Fun time. Let's be honest, Johan is a bit nuts. We know his life story is a tale of tragedy, starting with severe mistreatment against him and continuing with him uh, mistreating others. Suffice to say that by the ending, he's a young man who's been through a lot and is ready to end it all. We know that this is a big psyche change after the encounter with the Nameless Monster book before the library burning. A plan change from whatever the original plan was, and we won't get started on that, to the new plan of taking down Bonaparte and the perfect suicide. The first goal being a raging success, and the second, again, left up to interpretation. In regards to the second goal, let's draw on a couple of other moments in the series. In the final reveal, we learn that Johan's mother essentially sacrificed one of her children to Bonaparte for experiments. Johan asks, which was unwanted, him or Nina? This is picking up on his own interactions with Milos earlier. When on the hunt for Bonaparte, Johan begins talking to Milos while dressed as Nina, saying, why were you thrown away? Didn't your mum discard you because she hated you? Who wanted you? What is your reason for living? Johan's really talking to himself with Milos. Who wanted him? What is his reason for living? Despite being the last revelation we have of Johan, this is actually his first trauma chronologically, losing faith that his mother loved him. It's this memory that causes the breakdown in the library. This is the point that he remembers his own history of being thrown away by his mother. Remember that at this point he still believes he was the one who went to the Red Rose Mansion, not Nina. Kinderheim having lovingly locked away all of those memories back as a child. So a lot of the series builds towards this kind of dark end for Johan, something that is referred to in chapter 148 as the perfect suicide. The goal being to erase everyone who knows of his existence before dying at the hands of Tenma. In the chapter, Nina describes it as the perfect suicide, true solitude, the only expression of love. This is of course reflecting what Johan did to General Wolf years earlier, killing off everyone who knew who he was. Well, neat, it sounds like a great time, but this dam is full of holes. So many more people know about Johan now. The kids who played the rooftop game, Carl and Lottie, even our surviving main characters, Tenma, Nina, Lunga. As a perfect suicide goes, Johan is not the type to leave these threads unresolved. So either this was never a case of constructing the perfect suicide like Nina believes, or there's reason behind Johan only killing off the people who were assisting him in a criminal regard, perhaps ridding himself of those who knew pieces about his life that we'll never get to know. Personally, I believe the former to be true, that this was never intended to be a perfect suicide, rather a final grand manipulation of people before being killed himself. Nina only thinks that he's killing off everyone because that's the conclusion she's reached from her knowledge of Johan. Which also makes this a good time to pull back into talking about the ambiguous ending. I'll leave a link at the end of this video to an amazing explanation of Johan's motivations that you should absolutely watch after this. Part of the joy of this series is that you, the reader, are profiling Johan along with all of the other characters. You're taking the evidences from the various lead characters and creating an interpretation of who this Johan is. Again, I'll mention I truly believe this ending to be intentionally ambiguous. The point is for you to apply your interpretation based on the case you were building through the series to infer where Johan is gone, and then contrast that with your own moral thoughts. With that being said, there's a key piece in this ending that deserves a mention, and it starts where Johan's plan changes, the nameless monster. The ending of this book goes. You don't need a name. You can be happy without a name, because we are nameless monsters. The boy ate the monster who went west. Even though he had finally found a name, there was no one left around to call him by it. Johan was such a wonderful name too. In the ending, Tenma gives Johan a name, the name his mother gave him. Names are closely related to a person's identity. Would that be the final straw in stopping Johan from being a nameless monster? The bullet he received in Ruenheim really was the death of Johan, allowing his original self to return. The final chapter of Monster, where we get a reveal about Johan's mother, is titled The Real Monster, referring of course to the mother. When Grimma talks to the old Kinderheim director, they discuss the opposite approach to raising children when compared to what happened in that orphanage. 
raising kids with love. The moment with the mother is when Johan loses his sense of love, creating the monster that he would later develop. It's that classic thing book people say to try and sound smart. There's Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster, but Frankenstein was the real monster all along. Well, the same thing is kind of at play here. Is the one who was at fault the mother, breaking the young boy's sense of worth right from the start? Again, interpretations mean everything, and this is why I think this ending works well. It leaves this incomplete feeling with you, despite being complete, leaving all of these big questions open about Johan, but also about how we interpret humanity, the nature of identity, and how far the depths of our psyches can go, as well as more hopeful ideas like the power of connection, finding joy in the act of living, or like the magnificent Steiner, finding your humanity once again. I know you can be overwhelmed, and you can be underwhelmed, but can you ever just be whelmed? I think you can in Europe. When I did my first read through of Monster years back, I felt like the ending really fell flat. Admittedly, I didn't pick up on the ambiguity in the ending. My main complaint was that Johan's perfect suicide seemed too small for the scope of his potential. Through the series, he's hailed as a future world leader, another Hitler, someone who controlled millions of dollars, manipulated titans of industry, someone who turned people over to his will, turning people into puppets. Why does this world-changing man have his final plan be to turning a rinky-dink little town against itself? And now I say to my past self, read the book, man. All the future world leader stuff is all put on Johan. It's not his journey. What I mean by this is that Johan himself never aspired to be someone like that. They were all from other characters looking to manipulate Johan to their own ends. Johan's ending revolves around his family or personal revenge on Bonaparte and then his death at the hands of Tenma, a personal ending stemming from his own nihilistic perspective. We see this when he shows Tenma the landscape of the end. Out from a character perspective, the events themselves call back to a lot of previous moments. It doesn't need to be a big bombastic over the top ending because it's the final weaving together of all of the threads that the series has laid down. Johan says that all lives are equal in death, referencing the start of Tenma's journey when Eva says that all lives aren't equal. Wim's father sees Johan as the seven-headed beast, calling back to the introductory quote from the Bible. Johan is shot in the head, and Tenma saves him once again, mirroring the start of the series. In the redemption argument, some like to refer to this as saving Johan's life the first time, and saving Johan's soul the second time. The fall of Ruinheim is a recreation of the fall of Kinderheim. The final shot of Johan's empty bed mirrors the first time he ran away after killing the hospital director. Johan's life begins and arguably ends due to Franz Bonaparte. Urasawa keeps tying it back to the rest of the series, and it makes this whole ending just so damn cohesive. Bravo. This series wraps up in a compelling and challenging way. It's one of those stories that will have you thinking about it years later because it raises so many questions about humanity and how we define ourselves. If you're after a deeper dive into Johan, some of the ideas he explores and his motivations, please, please, please go and watch this video from if you haven't already. I think this is genuinely among the best monster fan content out there at the moment and it's definitely worth your time. If you're interested in the sequel Another Monster, that'll be linked here-ish when that's out. We're going to go through the most important reveals that that story has for the main series, as well as a cheeky recommendation. Thanks for watching. This has been CG, and I'll see you Gs in the next one.